objective factors. We are still in that process of moving from the knowledge of the protective factors into putting it into action um, and to really implementing it in our lives um, and really completing the circle on our understanding of the protective factors. Um, so there are some slides that are very similar and look the same as they did last week. Um, for example, information on the Alliance and who we are and what we stand for, as well as information on the Alliance National Parent Partnership Council. Um, so I am Victoria Hilt and I live in Bremerton, but I serve as the co-chair of this Parent Partnership Council. And it is our goal to strengthen families by teaching the protective factors to um, individuals who work with families as a profession and to families who interact with families as just a normal social interaction. Uh, our goal is to prevent child abuse and neglect. But it, in addition to that, it's also to help make sure that when families fall, they don't fall so hard by building up these foundational characteristics that have proven to make strong families and strong communities. This is the same essential elements and common threads that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. The most important thing I want you to take from it is just understanding um, that it's important to know that what we do in those small but significant everyday actions impact how we build our parent partnerships and how our families go on to become stronger and more capable. And then one of the things that I really want to make sure that we do today um, is really identify and recognize um, the confidence that we have in the protective factors. So do you feel confident going out and talking about these with other people? Because after we're done with these weeks of diving in and just digging really deep into the protective factors, I hope that's what you'll do. In your everyday actions where you're working with families, I hope that you'll bring this up in conversation. Maybe not the framework, maybe not the technical jargon or the statistics or facts, but the core feeling and meaning of each protective factor. And I wanna help you use that lens to identify moments when you can. That's our goal here. That is what we're trying to do. So as always, I like to make sure that we understand what the protective factors are by definition and in practice. These are the official definitions that the Children's Trust Fund Alliance uses in all of their work to explain what these characteristics are that support families. It's easier to remember when you use your hand and you have the five protective factors. I know that I've gone over it each time, but sometimes we have new people, so I'm going to go over it again. And again, the reason I love this so much is because it was made by parents to help really bring it home for other parents to be able to teach to other parents. And that's really what ECAP, Head Start, and really early learning programs have is that um, parent to parent piece. And so I think it's really important. So we use our thumb to remember social and emotional competence of children because a thumbs up is one of the first ways we learn to communicate our emotions. Your index finger represents knowledge of parenting and child development because you are your child's first teacher. Your middle finger can help you remember social connections because it should never stand alone. We all need a positive social network. The ring finger stands for parental resilience because your first commitment must be to yourself in order to be strong for others. And then your pinky finger signifies concrete support in times of need because it is the smallest finger and reminds us that we all need help sometimes. And I love that because it's easy to remember. 
you can carry it through. You don't have to have a piece of paper in your pocket that has the definitions. Just try to remember what they each stand for and you can help teach them. Now this week, we're gonna focus more on the social and emotional aspect of children. We did cover this a few weeks ago um, and I did not play this video because of time. So I'm bringing it back in. It's an empathy explanation, which is very pivotal when we're trying to teach children how to be emotionally competent and socially aware of themselves. I think it's an essential characteristic of a person, their ability to be empathetic, and it's something that we can strengthen. This video, um, I think I mentioned, is, has Brene Brown speaking, um, and it kind of leads into the next thing that we're going to do to dive in deeper to social and emotional competence of children. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for you now. And let me know if you can't hear it. <gasps> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So that is the empathy video. And I already have a, a comment to love that. Um, it, this is one of my favorite uh, ways to show how to build connection between people. And I think it becomes very important that we remember that when we're trying to connect with children. And that'll come into play here in just a moment. So this last image is just a reminder of the Strengthening Families framework and how the strategies that we put into place combined with the everyday actions, lead to the protective factors, building stronger families. Different people 
learn different ways. And so that's why I include different versions of the same thing in terms of how they connect. So that depending upon how you learn, I've provided you the tools you need to show the connection. Today, we're focusing on the social and emotional competence of children. The everyday actions that we do that help build this in children is first helping parents foster their child's social and emotional competence, model that nurturing support to children so that they can replicate it, make sure that we've included social and emotional aspects into the programming that we implement, help children develop a positive social and cultural identity, and respond proactively when we see social and emotional needs for a family. Today, when we go into our breakout groups, I would like us all to focus on this question. And I think that when you read it, you'll see why I brought in empathy and the video. And the question is, how are you talking with your children about their big feelings? Can you share any tools or specific activities that you are using during this crisis that you use when you talk to your children about their emotions? And the idea is that we are going to take all of you and split you up into small groups and you discuss this. I'll put the question in the chat box so that you can all discuss it. You'll still be able to see it in your own personal rooms. And then when you come back, we'll need a volunteer to share kind of a consensus of what you learned. And the hope is that when we go into these breakout rooms and you're sharing how you're empathizing with children, you'll be able to give each other ideas and you'll be able to um, develop new everyday actions that you might be able to use. All right, so let me go ahead and put the question in the chat box. Now the question itself says, how are you talking with your children? And I just want to emphasize that this could be small children, it could be older children, it could be adult children. The idea is to really talk about how you're connecting with people during this time. How are you talking about their big feelings during COVID? How are you talking with them about big feelings in general? I know I recently did one of those Facebook copy and paste posts where you ask your child like 10 questions and it was very insightful to hear how she views things because without asking her I don't know but that allows me to connect with her more. And I'm just getting it into the chat box right now. Apparently, I no longer succeed at typing and speaking at the same time. Katie, would you be able to break us into um, breakout rooms? somewhat evenly spaced or do you need me to do that? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the breakout rooms.
All right, you should all be invited to join breakout rooms. You accept that. Now, if you are in the main room and you received a request to join a breakout room, I ask that you accept it so you can move to that room. Katie, can you hear me? And if you're in the main room and you have an invitation to join a breakout room, please accept it. Jennifer, can you hear me? All right, 
I'm going to bounce around from room to room real quickly, and then I'll be right back.
right, I think almost everyone is back now. Thank you all so much for participating in those breakout rooms. Um, in order to really um, have the best experience with this, I wanna make sure that we have the opportunity to um, share. And so to do that, what I am going to do is I am going to share what's called a whiteboard in Zoom. Um, to, do, to use whiteboard in a Zoom platform, you start by clicking on new share if you have the um, permissions to share. And when you do so, one of the options is whiteboard. And I am gonna do that right now. So now instead of the PowerPoint, you should all see a big white space. Yes? Okay, great. At the, on your screen, you should have, um, a more or options button on your controls. Do you have that? If you're on a cell phone, you may not have these tools as an option, but if you do, if you go to more and then annotate bar, you should get a bar at the top of your screen that has a few options of what you can use on the whiteboard. If you have these options on your screen, I would invite you to use one of them. For example, you can go to stamp and then put stamps on. Um, you can write text. You can draw a picture. Thank you so much. See, that's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. So if you are one of the people that would like to report out from your group or you were selected as the person to report out, I would encourage you to unmute yourself and I will type your answers as you're talking as best as I can. Or you have the ability to add the um, reporting out straight to the picture. And then I will save that. And that is how we will share the things that we have learned. If you have your annotate bar out, you can also save it. So if you are gathering um, methods, strategies, everyday actions, you will be able to save the whiteboard as well. So uh, would anybody from breakout room one like to speak? or two, or three, or four, or five. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself and just start talking. I don't know if anybody well, else one is... thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Anna Mae, why don't you go? <laughs> so I'm with, I was with group three and um, we really didn't get to dive into the full question, but to get an idea of different age groups that we're dealing with and different things that are happening in people's homes. For one being, having multiple age children, it's been really tough for scheduling was the main thing I'm kind of hearing, different schedules. And I work with very young children, birth to three. And the biggest thing I see with my families is trying to help them, parents to give emotions and feelings a name so that the children have a better understanding of what they're feeling and be able to give it a name because I think they're and the parents agree, they're feeding off of the parent stress and the parent emotion. And I hear that one complaint from the parents. It's not as much as a complaint, but 
this is something new I'm hearing. They seem to be more needy. They seem to want more time because they're always home now. And the parents are more stressful about how things are going to look in the next, who knows how long, whatever that looks like. Right, that's some good feedback. And I totally relate to it, 100%. Mm -hmm. Chantel, you wanted to speak? I was just typing some into the, um, onto the whiteboard, but something that I really liked from the group was the check-in chart. And we didn't really know what that was, so they kind of explained it. And it's really just like a check-in for the family, uh, like their emotions and how they're feeling. I know we do something similar in class, which is awesome. Um, but I think it's it's pretty cool to do something where we're just checking in with the families to see where they're at emotion-wise. And, you know, a lot of families just say they're fine. And um, I think having the check-in chart kind of gives it um, kind of a broader canvas to work with. Um, we also talked about just different questions depending on the age of the child. Um, you know, we all have different age children we work with and different age children in our homes. And then we also talked about like if parents are having big feelings with anxiety and stuff like that to, you know, not share too much to scare the kids, but um, I don't know, to have real conversations, I guess, but not to feed their children their anxiety, if that makes sense. Yes. Making it normal to have big feelings, but not putting their big feelings on the children. Does that sound right, Chantal? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to go? Uh, can I chair from the Spanish line? Please. Okay, so general is like giving the space to the child um, so they can calm down and get about get out of that feeling. And then when they're calm down, they're more receptive uh, to hear and to talk. Um, also, it's um, not take not not uh so talk to them in a way that we don't create any kind of um panic on the children so just let them know what is going on that why are we staying at home and all this but just in a way that um we don't um let them know that there's a lot of i mean not with and yeah not go not go moving forward just like the person uh, said um, before, like don't pass that feeling to the child. Um, and also and one more thing is that, for example, sometimes it's very difficult to not um, transmit that feeling, especially if in this situation, uh, both of the parents of the mom that chair, um, they were diagnosed with the COVID and it, it is really hard to talk to the children and not transmit that feeling um, and give them the strength. And, but inside of you as an adult, as a mom, knowing that your parents are dealing with this situation and they're not here with you. I mean, they're, they're very far away from you. So it's very hard. So just trying to, to control that. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of hard. And then some, um, so also doing yoga, um, exercise of, do, of yoga, it's, um, it's another way to, to do it and also distract them. So if they're having a situation and you are giving them the space and you're giving them the time and the child continue, just um, do another thing to distract the attention so they can get rid of that easily. So I think that that's it. Um, can you repeat the first one for me? Sorry. So give them the space to the child. Right, okay. Yeah, 
So yes. give them a space so they can come down. And then after that, they are ready to talk and especially to listen and to talk. All right, thank you so much. I'm trying to capture what you're saying um, and I just wanna make sure that I get it correctly. If I have something wrong, let me know, please. Um, so that was three. Do we have anybody else who would like to report out? Going off of that, we were kind of talking about um, also giving space. And I think one person mentioned it, that in her family, they, they use, they describe it as timeout, but in a positive light saying they, she teaches her kids and for herself that to recognize when they need a timeout in a sense of just taking a break and um, to have either to be alone or to do something you enjoy or um, yeah, just to take time to take a breather. Um, and so I like that just thinking of it more as a positive thing and a way to describe that as in recognizing it, helping the kids recognize when they need that time. Um, and I know that's something that we kind of have used to um, with families too in talking to parents. And we use that in the classroom with like a calm down cube or a corner that's like a quiet time. Um, and then another thing that I know I've seen teachers use on my team is they actually, it was for this time too, they created a, a shout out box. And so they put, um, they use like a cereal box or something, some kind of cardboard box. And then they cut a hole and put like a paper towel roll in it and then used it, um, showed parents and kids and had, had it as a way to get out your feelings if you feel like you just need to yell or um, scream, but it's like a healthy outlet instead of maybe kids taking that out on their siblings or parents taking that on kids. And so the teacher even said to parents, like encourage them to make one for themselves or to, to emulate for the kids how to use it in a healthy way. And so I thought that was a creative idea. Um, as a way to, because, you know, there's all times, there's, there's times where we just need to yell and that's okay, <laughs> to, or just cry or let feelings out. So um, that was something different. And I think otherwise we were just kind of talking about, yeah, helping each other recognize and first recognizing for yourself what you're feeling and then also listening to your kids um, and validating what they're feeling this time, um, no matter what that is. Yeah, I think that for a long time, um, I remember um, being told that I could scream into a pillow and that that was okay, but you can't scream at other people. Um, and I think that uh, that was a therapeutic use for some time. Um, I now with my own child, I say that we just both need grace and space and we're both going to make mistakes and we might both say things we don't mean, but um, we take a break and we give each other the space and the grace to come back and say, can we try that again? Um, and so I think that's really important. Um, so I think there are two groups left that have not reported out. It's okay if you don't want to share, but I'm also more than happy to um, take down your answers for you as best as I can. And thank you so much um, for those who have unmuted and uh, spoken for the groups. I was a group number one. Okay. Hi. I uh, just, it was the idea of um, about that a par uh, teachers can try to connect with the parents and they said some different social stories. I'll have some classes like uh, and describe about zone of regulations, you know, like how it's like emotions and everything, uh, regulate yourself, like red, blue, green, yellow, stop, sink, something like this for little kids. And different way to explain the situation to the kids. So 
it was a social stories zone of regulation and another way it's um, teachers or educators contacting the parents and asking how they're doing so really focusing on reaching out and connecting with the parents right now I think so, yes, and kind of like connection before correction. Oh, yes, I like that. Connection before correction. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, you know, I've recently someone uh, reminded me that an escalated, an adult cannot de-escalate a child. And I know I've said that multiple times these last couple of weeks, but that's because it's so true. Um, and if your child is escalated or um, deregulated, it's very difficult to bring them down if you're also reacting. So it sounds like um, this whole brain idea of like, if you're too high, you cannot help yourself and you can help others. So first, it's like coming back to regulate yourself then try to connect with your child and then speak about it. What's what's there. And I think that ties back into some other things that we've covered over the last few weeks, which is like your own personal resilience, making sure that you have met your own personal needs before you go about trying to meet someone else's. If your bucket is empty, then you have no water to share into somebody else's bucket. Um, so I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, that we have to, and, and then I think we have covered that quite a bit by being that self-recognition of our own emotions and how they're impacting us and how we are regulating ourselves. Um, that's the best way to teach children by modeling that behavior. Um, so I, I'm going to go, oh, go ahead. I just want to say that it's very popular to be very positive about everything. But when a situation like this happens, we cannot be like, wear the positive mask and uh, push, them, push ourselves to behave like happy or funny or something else. So it's also I mean, extra effort from us. So I think if we're going to be true ourselves, but kind of calm, that will be better than playing some role. Because it's usually we always try to be much more uh, pretend to behave positive, but not be. Do I stick too complicated? Yeah, I, okay. I, I think I got that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. A lot of times we try to uh, kind of update ourselves and behave like nothing is going on, everything is okay. But when a situation like this happens, it's something happened. We can neglect the situation. So we have to understand what's going on and try to deal with it and don't pretend that there's nothing going on. So something like this. Be real, be your in time, be conscious. I like that. Thank you. Yes, Maricela. Yeah, someone else shared that it's also very healthy to know how to breathe and um, help our children to learn how to breathe. Because it's through breathing that we as an adult can get more patient, but also for the children, when they are breathing in the correct way, we help them to calm themselves. And, and it's because a lot of times, even us as an adult don't know how to breathe. So there is a lot of exercise on breathing on YouTube that uh, this mom can re uh, really highly recommend. So it's because it's very important important to for us as an adult um, know how to do it so we can teach our children oh I like that so much it's so true um, the breathing that we use does make a big difference and uh, how we feel and how we act um, every night uh, my daughter and I go through an exercise and it involves taking deep breaths in deep breaths out um, because that is helpful and it calms your body down. Um, if you walk your child through simply breathing in and out three times, uh, it is very helpful because 
it literally physically calms them down and you don't have to like tell them calm down. The breathing automatically does it. I want to, I see something in the chat box. I want to make sure we don't um, miss that. It's okay to sit with our uncomfortable feelings instead of trying to be positive all the time to feel the feelings. Yes. Um, so I'm going to save this because I think that this has been a very fruitful um, conversation. And I think you can walk away with a lot of really good uh, everyday strategies that you can bring to your parents, um, to the people that you live with or share with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the presentation now. There's only a few more slides and then I'll let you guys go. Um, but I want to highlight that the Parent Partnership Council has tools that are aligned with the five protective factors. They're available on the website for you to download and share as much as you would like. They're free and they're being translated into Spanish right now. Um, Also, I would encourage you to join the Birth Parent National Network. Um, it's a wonderful network for um, sharing and connecting. They are um, doing weekly caring conversations right now. And it has been a very uh, fruitful experience for all of the parents involved. They're able to share uh, foster parents, birth parents, kinship caregivers. Um, so if you yourself would like to join, I would encourage you to do that. If you're working with a family, that is a foster family, a kinship family, um, or a birth parent family, I would encourage you um, to encourage them to join as well, uh, because it is a, a wonderful network to be a part of. And right now, uh, if parents are feeling isolated, this can be a way to connect. And with that, um, I am done sharing information for this week. Uh, we're going to wrap up the rest of the protective factors, I think, the next time that we meet. Um, but I hope that as we have been processing this and going through, that we are making this more real and more um, of something that you can do every day to build strong families. So thank you very much for being with us today and I hope you all stay well. Thanks everybody. Thank you for sharing. Wonderful. Thank you.